So welcome everyone to the roundtable challenges and perspectives to tenure security in African cities. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, my name is Gabriela Mercurio. I currently lead the Cities Alliance Innovation Program. I will chair this event and it is a pleasure to have all of you here today. I know it is very early to some of you, so thank you very much for being here. Um, just a few housekeeping notes before we start. So we have secure translation, so you can choose either English or French audio channels. And if you have any question during the event, please use the Q&A box in Zoom or leave a comment if you're watching it on Facebook. I will now call upon my colleague, Anna Claudia Fosbach for the opening remarks. Anna, over to you. Thank you, Gabi. Welcome everyone. I see we have here a full house today, uh, which demonstrates the relevance of the matter. Um, we know that uh, land tenure is very critical in fostering uh, development and overcoming structural inequalities of our society. Uh, it's very cl clear though that land tenure is a political issue. Uh, we already have the technical tools uh, to deal with that. This webinar is an example of that. Um, so uh, we wanted today um, to have a very high level discussion where we um, present uh, cases on the ground but we also discuss what are the matters, what are the issues that are preventing us to go at scale uh, with land tenure security. Um, the issue affects, um, in a more accurate manner, Africa. Um, a statistics shows that 90% of the rural land is unregistered. Um, only 4% of the urban land is registered. So the numbers are really, really calling our attention to this um, deep problem um, in Africa, but overall in the global south. So we are happy um, to host, co-host this webinar today. Um, um, the experiences that will be presented here, showcased here, are a result of a collaboration between the Cities Alliance or Media Network and PLACE, um, where we together selected innovative cases in Africa in promoting grant tenure and combining social, tech, social interaction technology um, to promote land tenure um, in the region. Uh, but also we invited our Cities Alliance members, you know, um, high level practitioners and experts to uh, bring these projects uh, to, um, to the major picture. So using these experiences to understand uh, why uh, can't we move at scale and what are the opportunities for us to change the ecosystems and, and, and to really at scale uh, promote land tenure and, and generate um, development in this sense. Um, we are combining our internal forces um, I managed. Uh, I managed the program on informality. Uh, but also, I come from Latin America, so I manage our portfolio in Latin America, which is very advanced in terms of laws uh, regarding uh, land tenure security and lots of innovations and experiences. But we have our colleague uh, Julia Mati as well, uh, who is managing our gender program, and we understand that um, uh, land tenure uh, is especially critical. In, in promoting women empower, empowerment and overcoming um, gender uh, inequalities that we face. Um, and of course, Gabriela, uh, who managed uh, this innovation program uh, that's actually uh, the, the highlight here today. So uh, thank you um, everyone for, for being here as audience, as panelists, and really uh, hope to have an out of the box discussion and, and, and look at the big picture, but also the micro um, issues that affect you know, the daily uh, life uh, of innovators in this field. Thank you very much. And I think um, I will pass now to Amy for her welcome remarks. Thank you, Anna Claudia. Hi everyone, a warm welcome. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to say a few words. Uh, I'm Amy Regis with PLACE. Um, PLACE is a, a nonprofit that spun out of Omidyar Network at the beginning of last year. 
So we, before we dive into the roundtable discussion, I thought I would just provide some brief context around the origins of the Secure Tenure um, in African Cities Challenge. In 2018, Omidyar Network's property rights initiative had three areas of focus. One was to increase delivery of property rights. Second one was to invest in tech innovation to make it easier, faster, and cheaper to access property rights. And the third one was to grow a movement around the importance of property rights, which Anna Claudia just uh, told us a little bit about. So we thought that conducting a challenge focused on securing tenure could contribute to achieving all of those objectives. In view of rapid urbanization and other issues facing cities on the continent, we wanted that challenge to be focused on Africa. At the time, our investment hypothesis was that through stimulating innovation from the bottom up, and rewarding innovators that were operating at community and micro levels, we hope to identify new solutions to strengthening urban property rights that could be spread and scaled. We weren't sure where innovation would, would originate. So we wanted the challenge to be open to NGOs, to entrepreneurs and to small businesses. Based on expertise networks and their experiences and learnings from previous innovation fund work, we thought Cities Alliance would be the ideal partner to help us seek out innovation in Africa's urban landscapes. Our hope was that the microfund grants would identify innovative solutions to property rights challenges facing Africa. And we hope that national and local policymakers would take up and scale the innovations identified through the challenge grants. We learned a lot from executing this challenge and you'll hear more about that over the next couple of hours. It's been a real pleasure working with Cities Alliance in this effort and special thanks to Billy Cobbett, but Billy Cobbett, to Gabriella Mercurio and to Erica Puspa. I'd also really like to thank all of the innovation grant winners for your hard work, especially in view of the unique challenges that you all faced over the past year due to COVID. Your work um, throughout that period has truly been inspiring. And so um, on that note, let's dive into it in a little bit more detail. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Amy. Uh, before we proceed with the roundtable discussion, I would also like to say a few words about the Innovation Program and the Security Initiative on the Cities Alliance. So um, we had in Cities Alliance a funding window called Catalytic Fund. And around 2017, 2018, this was remodeled to what is now our Innovation Program. And through this work, we want to recognize the transformative pot potential from within the local communities um, to make small scale financing available at the local level, while also expanding our pool of potential fund recipients um, with the aim of allowing us to also reach smaller or recently established local organizations and provide them opportunities for innovation and impact in local projects while strengthening stakeholder collaboration. So we do not work only with the concept of innovation as something that needs to be disruptive, uh, but we also consider you know, those concepts, products and processes that are either absolutely new or they are novelty in how they are applied or adapted to a specific context. So with support from a media network in place, we implemented our first innovation um, initiative in 2019 and we launched a call for proposals on tenure security in African cities. So we have selected um, five projects which received up to, uh, to 50,000 US dollars in funding each and had up to 12 months to be implemented. So once all projects have ended, we conducted an analysis to get insights about how small scale and incremental interventions can enhance tenure security. And based on what we could uh, observe and learn from these projects, we have decided to convene this event. So today we have four of these pro uh, this four projects with us, and they will first quickly introduce their approach. And after that, we will have a conversation among uh, representatives from these projects and global partners about some of the challenges and opportunities for securing tenure. Uh, so I will now share my screen. Uh, I hope yes. you can see it now. Yes. Great. And I will now call upon Barthélemy Boyka, 
from the Initiative Régionale de Documentation et d'Accompagnement Communautaire au Développement, or IRDAC, to briefly introduce himself and tells us about their work in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Barthélemy, over to you. Um, you have two minutes for this very quick introduction. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, bonjour à, à tous. Uh, IRDAC uh, a reçu uh, un financement des, des Cités Alliance. Et uh, pour ce financement, nous avons mis en place un projet, uh, Drone pour la sécurisation uh, foncière et l'autonomisation de la femme. Le projet visait à, à moderniser la gouvernance uh, foncière en s'appuyant principalement sur, uh, sur deux leviers. Nous avons travaillé sur euh, d'abord les leviers de la participation des acteurs et nous nous sommes dit euh, au travers de dialogues euh, multi-acteurs où euh, nous avons mis en place euh, les communautés locales. Dans les communautés, c'est beaucoup plus euh, les agriculteurs pauvres qui sont membres d'une. Nous avons pris un échantillon de membres d'une association du développement local qui s'appelle Radecas, qui était nos cibles. Et au travers de dialogues multi-acteurs, nous avons réuni ces communautés, nous avons réuni les chefs coutumiers qui sont les propriétaires des terres. Je salue en passant le, le grand chef coutumier de, de Kassangourou, un fou modifiement que je vois en ligne, euh, qui suit avec intérêt ces, ces webinaires. Et il y avait des chefs coutumiers qui sont venus également. Il y a l'administration française, il y avait les secteurs privés. Et au travers de la participation de ce dialogue avec tous ces parties prenantes, ils ont discuté pour pouvoir clarifier la tenue foncière euh, sur place. À partir de cette clarification, nous avons utilisé le deuxième pilier du projet, qui était l'intégration des technologies. Comment, avec euh, l'aide des technologies de, de point, nous avons utilisé les drones. Euh, comment, avec les drones, comment, avec les, les applications logicielles, des systèmes de formation géographique, de photogrammétrie, euh, de web mapping, euh, de tous ces logiciels, comment nous pouvions arriver à numériser les cadastres But tell me, I think we are losing you. Donc, le projet a utilisé l'administration foncière en RDC, un système ancien et comment plus productif pour documenter, numériser et gérer. Allô? 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 Now you're back. Allô? Yeah. On t'écoute, on t'écoute maintenant. Uh, yeah, Barthélémy, your connection is... Okay. It's not very stable. Maybe you can turn off your camera and this will help for now. Okay, c'est bon. Okay. okay je, je disais que le projet que nous avons mené, c'était un projet pour moderniser la gouvernance foncière dans la ville de, de Kassangou, nous avons choisi une ville qui est à 35 km de la grande euh, ville de Kinshasa, la grande mégalopole, et la ville qui subit toute la pression foncière. Et dans cette ville de Kassangou, le projet s'est appuyé sur des leviers pour améliorer la gouvernance foncière. C'était d'abord la participation des communautés. 
on voit les communautés qui sont dans des forums, on a discuté, il y avait des chefs coutumiers, il y avait des communautés de cultivateurs pauvres, il y avait également l'administration foncière, et c'est cet ensemble des communautés, cet ensemble des, des gens qui sont mis ensemble pour discuter, pour pouvoir clarifier la tenue foncière dans la ville. Et les, les niveaux le plus bas, les communautés, ont eu l'opportunité d'échanger avec les décideurs oui, l'opportunité de collecter les données de la base pour pouvoir amener ces données au niveau de l'administration pour prendre en compte. Et il n'y avait pas seulement le volet des, des participations pour la clarification, il y avait un deuxième volet. Le deuxième volet, c'est l'intégration des technologies. Nous nous sommes servis des technologies de pointe, notamment, on a utilisé les drones, nous avons utilisé des solutions euh, logicielles, des systèmes d'information géographique, euh, des cas de photogrammétrie, de web mapping, tout cet ensemble de nouvelles technologies euh, nous ont servi pour numériser, pour documenter les cadastres. Euh, documenter les cadastres, parce qu'en RDC, euh, le cadastre n'est pas documenté. Il y a pas, il y a, dans beaucoup d'endroits, il n'y a pas un cadastre qui est actualisé. Et nous nous sommes servis de ce projet pilote pour donner un exemple au, au gouvernement, donner un modèle, dire au gouvernement que voilà euh, une voie à suivre en intégrant les technologies, en intégrant la participation des communautés. On peut bien numériser les cadastres et avec la numérisation du cadastre, on peut bien arriver à sécuriser les titres anciens, notamment les titres des communautés membre de Radecas. Radecas, c'est une association locale qui nous a servi de cible et nous avons travaillé avec eux pour sécuriser les titres. Actuellement, euh, comme résultat, nous avons euh, 98 demandes des, des titres des membres de Radecas qui sont en attente de formalisation. Et parce que c'est des technologies de pointe que nous avons euh, utilisé. Nous avons également renforcé les capacités, les capacités de la jeunesse. Nous avons renforcé les capacités de l'administration foncière. Nous avons renforcé également les capacités de la police. La police locale s'est intéressée parce que la police a besoin également des données pour assurer la sécurité. Voilà un peu en gros le travail que nous avons fait. Nous avons produit un modèle numérique qui est d'ailleurs approuvé maintenant par l'administration foncière et la commission pour la réforme foncière, qui est la commission qui est chargée de la réforme. Je signale qu'en RDC, il y a une réforme foncière qui est en cours. Et cette commission et l'administration ont validé cette, ces modèles que nous avons mis en place en entendant de mettre ces modèles à échelle. Voilà un peu en gros le projet que nous avons mené à Katangoulou. Vous voyez les femmes tout autour, euh, chacune en train de localiser sa parcelle dans la grande carte que nous avons produite, euh, qui a également euh, euh, de laquelle nous avons ressorti les plans cadastral, le seul plan cadastral que nous avons actuellement, le seul plan cadastral actualisé que nous avons en RDC, c'est celui qui a été produit par ce projet pilote. Voilà pour l'instant. Euh, ce que je fais, donner des grandes lignes du projet que nous avons mené. Merci. Ok, merci beaucoup, Barthélémy. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker represent the Transaction Support Center. I will call either Keisha Rust from the Center for Affordable Housing Finance in Africa or Ilana Melzer from 71.4. To please take the floor. You also have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's Casey Russ speaking here and, and Alana Melzer is, is with me. Um, and so we're very happy to have a conversation about this with, with everyone present. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, the, I'll put my video on as well. There we are. Um, the, the South African case is almost paradoxical because it exists within the context of a tenure security or land restitution program. 
Um, essentially, since 1994, the South African government, the Department of Human Settlements, has been implementing a large scale subsidized housing delivery program. And in that period is delivered over about 4 million units um, and given those away entirely for free to qualifying beneficiaries. Um, however, of those, we can only see about 2 million of them on the deeds registry. And the government acknowledges that there's a real titling backlog that has happened. And so these properties, although they've been delivered to provide tenure security, that tenure is insecure because the title has not been transferred to the people who have been granted the dwellings. At the same time, we're aware that even among properties where there have been titles granted, that the households, there are many transactions that have been happening informally. So people go to the police station and ask a pol the police station to stamp a sale agreement, but that that's not formally recorded within the deeds registry. And so we have an increasing number of properties across the country where the person who believes and would be recognized as, as the owner of that property is not formally acknowledged as such on the actual deeds registry itself. So within that context, um, my, my colleague Alana Melzer in 71.4 proposed the establishment of the Transaction Support Center and they've been driving that and we've been very happy to support the effort. Um, the Transaction Support Center was, was set up as an action research initiative so that by engaging with households who have titling problems, either they never received their primary title or they, they had participated in an informal transaction so that the current state of ownership was not accurately reflected on the deeds registry. We thought that by offering an advice office where people would come and get support, we would then come to better understand the, the problem. And so the Cities Alliance then supported us in documenting the first two years of activity. Um, about how that worked and, and what we learned. And the report is available on our website um, and has really made a huge difference in how we go forward. Essentially the way in which the TSC works, it exists in, in a township in, in Cape Town known as Kailicha, and it's an advice office where people come in and present their cases. And then we have the, the office staff within the TSC who review the case and then address all of the legal issues that are there and then present that to, to a conveyancer who can then affect the transfer. Well, that all of the legal issues that exist um, is, is increasingly complicated and difficult. And what's come out of this whole effort, and we've now, we've got, I mean, as of last month, we looked at uh, 1,229 cases over the course of our, um, over the course of the past two and a half years. And of those, we have been able so far to, to secure 237 title deeds. Um, it's an incredibly difficult and complicated process to resolve these title deeds. And, and I think the main lesson that's come out, which I think is worth thinking about here, is that tenure security, had a, a, lot of the, a lot of that is an administrative issue. And it's about the ability of local authorities and all of the other, the provincial authorities and the departments of justice and land affair and, and, and so on, all of them working together to provide the administrative support that's necessary for a transaction to be easy and, and, and affordable and accessible to a low income household. So tenure security is about making the systems work and work appropriately for low income people in low value properties. I think I'll stop there as a, as a summary of what we do. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kesia. Uh, our next speaker is Diana Oshira from Pamoja Trust, who will talk about their work implementing the social tenure domain model in Kenya. Diana, over to you. Thank you, Gabby. And um, thank you uh, to Cities Alliance for this uh, platform. I think it's a good opportunity for us to learn and share. Um, my name is Diana Washira. I work with Pamoja Trust, uh, which is a civil society organization in, in Kenya. And uh, we focus a lot on the urban uh, context. Um, so all, most of our work is on the informal settlements around land, around housing and uh, delivery of basic services. 
Uh, now, our project uh, focused on upscaling uh, the social tenure domain model uh, in order to promote integ integrated and sustainable land use, as well as to improve uh, tenure security um, for the informal settlements. Now, um, this partnership or with Cities Alliance was built off the work that Pamoja Trust had been doing for a long period of time uh, with support from the Global Land Tool Network under the UN Habitat. And I'm glad uh, Danilo is here with us today. So what we had been doing was we had been trying to demonstrate how to really understand the context of uh, the urban uh, of tenure security, especially in the urban areas. So uh, with the GLTN, we uh, had uh, um, implemented the social tenure domain model, which is a specialization of the general land administration domain model. So then the social tenure domain model then um, really described more, describes more nuanced tenure and land administration components that do not fit within um, this general uh, domain system. So the STDM then was conceptualized to fit within the complexities of urban tenure. So um, with GLTN, then we had done a lot of uh, work um, in terms of demonstrating the cap capabilities of uh, this social tenure domain model. Uh, so when Cities Alliance came on board and supported us and facilitated us, what we focused on was now upscaling um, this work to, uh, uh, to a national scale. And this was based on the evidence uh, that we had seen that actually uh, social technological innovations such as STDM actually herald hope for off register communities, such as those in the informal settlements. So then with Cities Alliance, uh, we've been able to really engage. Um, I think most of our engagement has been at a three tier uh, level. That is from the micro to the macro, from community to government. And it has been really bringing together um, communities communities and their governments, for communities to demonstrate um, the possibilities of having these social um, uh, technological innovations as ways of them uh, actualizing their vision for tenure security. So it's been, I think, uh, quite um, an impressive uh, one year with Cities Alliance in terms of really uh, demonstrating this um, uh, the, the outcomes of the STDM to our, our local governments up to a point where at, at currently we're looking at how do we um, uh, come up with guidelines for institutionalizing this STDM process uh, in terms of now and then how can governments uh, do it because we are, we, are, we are sure we are demonstrating it from sort of a, a, a lower level. So um, I think most of the work that we have done also has been around focus with a focus on uh, women and youth. Uh, and trying to understand the role of the youth and the role of women um, in this tenure conversation and having also in mind the, the aspect of sustainability of this process even within communities. So I think um, in brief, um, that's what I can say about uh, the projects that we have been doing. And then I think even on the screen, we can see sort of the methodology that uh, we, we, know, we use in terms of engaging community. And, and I must say that for us, um, for these social uh, technological innovation, innovations, interventions, we take it as more of a process. So then, then there's that take up by the community and that buy-in, and it's not more of a, uh, a one-off thing. So then communities lead this process up from inception to up to uh, engagement. And through that process is where we have a lot of building of capacities and a lot of um, demonstration of how these things can work, also based and of course, uh, based on their social capital and how they coexist within uh, these spaces. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Um, last but not least, I am sorry, Primos, but you have to correct my pronunciation. I will now call Primos Kovacic to give an overview of Spatial Collective's work in Zanzibar. Please, Primos. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Primos. I'm the founder of Spatial Collective. I'm, uh, here with my business partner, Justice, who was actually the, uh, you know, leading force in implementing this project. But since my job is just to talk, I'll talk and he will pitch in if, uh, if need be. Um, yeah, so ba very basically, we wanted to modernize the education process on Zanzibar and why the process needs modernizing. Um, in our work that we did before, uh, we, with a different project, we flew drones all over the archipelago and we found out that there is about 
500,000 buildings on the island. So the government wanted to adjudicate the entire archipelago. And if we're talking about 500,000 buildings, we're probably talking about a million or more plots which are there, right, including the rural areas. So um, when the government set out to adjudicate the archipelago, they only managed to do about 100 plots in several years. And uh, that is because um, the methods they were using, the technology they were using could not, not keep up with the demand. They did not have enough surveyors, they did not have enough equipment, and they would never do it in a lifetime doing it the old way. So we sat down with um, the adjudication department at the Commission for Lands on Zanzibar, with, which, with whom we have very good relations. And we said, how can we speed up the adjudication process? And uh, this is where Cities Alliance uh, came in and supported this initiative. And basically we, we checked how, how the adjudication happens currently, right? And we saw that there's a lot of bottlenecks there, for example, uh, all the data is collected on paper, which means that people themselves have to fill in the forms, they have to go to various offices to collect certain forms, make print, printed copies, they need to take passport pictures of themselves, they need to scan all sorts of documents, including their IDs. You can imagine, you know, for, um, uh, for people who maybe cannot afford some of these things, that, that, that might be very hard. Um, then secondly, once the data is collected, it's transported to the Commission for Lands where it's retyped into the Excel spreadsheets, which is another no-no because it's prone to mistakes. Plus, they only had one person working on that particular uh, issue. Then uh, only after all of that data is um, checked, um, the surveyor will go out and delineate the boundaries and put the beacons in place and uh, they only had one surveyor available for that for million plus plots on, on Zanzibar, right? So that would never happen the old fashioned way. The process took years just to go from data collection to giving people certificate of occupancy. So we said, okay, can we merge some of the new technologies out there and see if we can speed up the process a bit? And we focused on the data collection. So we moved from paper-based to digital data collection. And also we wanted to merge the, the collection of boundary points together with attribute data collection. So no more going to the offices to collect data, no more paper-based, no more surveyors going to the field separately. So all the data is collected at once. So it's a, um, with the help of Cadasta Foundation, we set up a tablet-based data collection form, which mimicked the paper-based form. Uh, and we included the drone imagery, so we could collect data such as, you know, pictures of people, their IDs, uh, the boundary points, the pictures of beacons that we put in place. So everything was digitized, sent into the database where it was uh, managed by an official uh, adjudication officer. So our process of data collection only takes between 15 minutes to an hour based on the plot size, which is um, Previously, it took years. Now it takes less than an hour, and um, you know we're um, in in about seven weeks. We and when I say we, we we train students from the University of Zanzibar to help us collect this data. Uh, they collected 700, more than 700 plots in about seven weeks, which is seven times more than what they were able to collect in a couple of years before, and. Um, now we're in the process where all the all these digital forms were printed into the printed format and distributed to the community members and landowners and the only uh, despite the fact the cities alliance project has ended now the, uh, we're moving on so the only process that is remaining which is undergoing right now is that uh, you know if uh, people agree with the data that was collected, if there is no disputes, then uh, they will receive certificate of occupancy. Uh, so about 700 plus property owners, right? So um, we're very excited about this project. I think it's, uh, we think it's a much better way and much faster way to collect data. Uh, and um, yeah, we're looking forward to like, uh, you know, uh, scaling it up. So let me stop just there. Thank you, thank you very much, Primoz. Thank you all for the presentations. And please allow me to remind the audience that if you have any question about the projects, please use the Q&A box or the Facebook comment option. Of course, you can also engage with them through the chat. 
Um, and also in Citizen Alliance website, we will also find a two pager with information about the approach, the lessons learned, and the achievements, as well as other resources from the project, um, such as blog posts and podcasts. We will leave you um, the, the link here in the chat and on Facebook as well. So the analysis that I, I, I mentioned previously that we have conducted once the projects were closed allowed us to identify topics that we considered really relevant when we talk about improving tenure security and how small scale and local projects can support this. So we will focus today's discussion in five topics. Um, they are legal frameworks, participation and multi-stakeholder engagement, socio-technological innovation, gender equality, and the role of partnerships and collaboration. So what we have done is that we have transformed these topics into questions, but only to help guiding the panelists, the audience, and also the facilitators. Um, but what we are doing today is not to ask each of these questions directly, but instead we want to have a more fluid, a more relaxed conversation bringing the perspectives from these local innovators and from the global partners about some of the challenges and the opportunities faced daily regarding these topics. So we will now move to the roundtable discussion. And um, for the panelists, I'll ask you to kindly say your name, role and organization when you intervene for the first time. And in parallel, we will put um, the bios will, will also be made available in the chat and on Facebook comments as well. So each intervention should be up to four minutes to allow time for all to participate. We have quite a gang today. Um, this facilitation will be done by my colleagues Anna Claudia Holzbach, who you already met, Julia Machi from our Cities for Women program, and myself. I will now invite Camille Bourguignon from the World Bank to kindly kickstart this um, very nice conversation. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Just want to make sure you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. So my name is Camille Bourguignon. I am a senior land administration specialist at the World Bank based in Washington, D.C., but working in the Africa region. So, of course, when you're talking about, you know, scaling up uh, and, and, and having, uh, adopting approach to secure land tenure at scale, the World Bank is, is definitely a uh, uh, one of the actor you want to interact with. Uh, we've been a uh, financing uh, operation in the land sector since the 60s uh, and in uh, the urban sector since the 70s. So we don't have time to discuss all that, but it's clear that you know we have a, a, an interest to help our clients, the governments, addressing these issues. Uh, today, um, we have uh, several operations in Africa. We've got uh, standalone projects, so projects really working only on land in Mozambique, Senegal, and Liberia. We have discussion in, for new projects in Burkina Faso, Tanzania, but we also have sectoral projects, agriculture, natural resource management, urban, working uh, with some components on land tenure. And then this is where we can see, for instance, some of your uh, intervention are in countries where we do have such operations. So Kenya, for instance, we have KISIP, uh, and, and what I'm hearing here seems to be relevant. So I don't know if you had been in touch with the TTL of, of the task team leader of, of that project, uh, but uh, definitely we are financing, uh, helping the government, government with land tenure regularization in slums and, and, and some of the difficulties. So one good thing in Kenya is the government seems to be very uh, uh, proactive and very open to uh, new approaches. Uh, so it's a, it's a key element when, when we want change is to have a, a government, the, the World Bank work with the governments, you know, so they need to be open to whatever innovation is proposed. Uh, and in Kenya, my, my understanding is the client is quite receptive. So uh, uh, as part of, of this operation like KISIP, it's always useful after we could have discussion about you know, how this approach could be uh, used. Key question we're facing in Kenya is, what do you do when you work in a, a settlement where you've got a lot of tenants? You know, you need to make sure the the transfer of rights you you make is going to be you know a benefit to both uh, structure owners and tenants. So that's a sensitive subject. The other things that is key is uh, um, sometimes finding approach, collective approach to tenure regularization when you cannot. A lot of time, one issue you you, meet, you face is plots are too small to be formalized. So you need to have some collective approach. And this is a type of practical thing where we're searching for 
approach that could be implemented at scale. Uh, DLC, we just approved a project in Kinshasa. Uh, and, and the idea right now is to work on what they call uh, fish parcellaire in Kinshasa. But there's also discussion with operation on agriculture in the, in, in, in the north, uh, east, north, north east part of, of, of DRC, where uh, some of the, it's more rural, but some of the approaches you discuss, discuss here may be, may be relevant. So I think uh, indeed you need to have uh, uh, approaches that are uh, consistent with the legal framework. One challenge you may face sometimes is approaches, innovative approaches may not necessarily fit in the legal framework. Uh, but I mean, I think what is key for us is always to demonstrate that it's not completely, uh, you know, outside, but also the client to be the, the government to really be supportive. Once you've got the support of the government, then even the bank has instrument to, to, to help with this type of legal reform. We've got development policy operation. And even as part of project, we commonly have indicators and objectives related to legal changes. Uh, cost is very important. You need to always be able to show that uh, you can deliver titles, collective or individual, at a reasonable price. And, and, and I think for us, with our clients, it's always important. We understand the modernization of the services is important, but there is often a need to accept that some reform is needed and to concentrate on the beneficiaries, the people, and being able to show uh, that uh, they, will, uh, they will get title. Participation is the, something the bank uh, really uh, 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 find really important. It's always embedded in a project. Uh, women's participation too. Commonly, you know, in tightening project, you, you make sure that women are uh, uh, on, 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 on the titles. Uh, I don't have time to, but those are principles that are very uh, uh, well uh, embedded in, in bank operation. So I think uh, it's more, you know, understanding them and, yeah. So I hope it, you know, it helped understanding how, what the role of the bank could be. And of course, we don't have much time to discuss today. So if anybody want to uh, contact me after, after this meeting, uh, I would be available. Thank you. Thanks very much, Camille. Um, Julia? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Camille, for this uh, overview. And you touch really all the, all the topic. I think you mentioned something very important. No? We saw um, innovation, uh, the use of technology, community engagement, uh, uh, but mainly pilot, pilot actions very innovative, demonstrative, but the question of scaling up and connecting this innovation with the existing regulatory framework, it is key. Uh, so in, in using also the results of this pilot in order to change the policy discourse, uh, changing land regulation. Um, we have here as a panelist, and I also kindly ask all the panelists maybe to switch off their, their camera, to, to switch on their, their camera so we can see all of you. Um, we have here a Jane Wero, um, which is um, which led a very important project in Kenya, uh, the Mukuru Special Planning Area System, which I think is very uh, important and demonstrative um, on how you can really connect pilot intervention, community participation, with really a um, um, big scale transformation and change in, in land policy and planning. So I would like to invite uh, uh, Jane uh, maybe to, to tell a bit more about this experience and, um, and also to, in a way, give also some suggestion to um, the different projects leader that I've just presented, how to scale up, how, could, how we can really make a big transformation at the city level. Please, Jane. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think the observation that it is important for us to be able to anchor our pilots in, um, in, in statutory frameworks is very important because if you're not able to anchor pilots into statutory frameworks, you're not able to scale up. And I can demonstrate this. This is well demonstrated in the Mukuru SPA because in the Mukuru SPA, we realized that um, we have uh, legislation that permits for upgrading of informal settlements. So under our physical planning act, section 23, provision is made for county governments 
to declare areas that have unique development challenges and opportunities as special planning areas. What this means is that uh, county governments are permitted to come up with unique solutions to the problems that these areas face. So they can develop plans that respond to those unique development challenges. So the county government of Nairobi in the year 2017 declared Mukuru. And after the declaration, it was required to develop plans within a period of two years. And those plans were developed. And at the moment, uh, the county government is implementing them. So I think one, what comes out of this is that um, this planning process is that the county was able to develop alternative standards for say roads that were able to minimize displacements because the areas in former settlements are dense areas that have very many people living in them. So if you take the normal those planning frameworks and standards, you realize then that the levels of displacement will be very high. So for instance, if you were to use the normal standards for roads, the whole of Bukuru would have just been a big road and there would have been no space for human settlement. So new alternative standards were developed for the road networks and then the use of alternative um, standards for sewers that were borrowed from other countries so that we could have sewer systems and allow households to connect to the sewer, which, was, which they were not previously able to do because of these new alternative standards. At the same time, the government is also looking at issues of tenure because Mukuru is on private land. This land was allocated to private individuals in the 80s and 90s. And the titles that they were given were long-term leaseholds that had special conditions of grant. And the special conditions of grant required the landowners to develop the land within a period of two years of the grant, which they failed to do. Under the conditions of grant, the county government was permitted to enter and take back the land in the case of failure to develop. So what has happened in Mukuru is that the county government has entered and has taken back the land because now it has laid down roads, built hospitals, and is doing sewer systems. So they have taken back the land and are using it for development. But the legal process that is required in order for a proper taking has not yet been instituted. So we are hoping that this can happen because this is a fantastic precedent because a lot of land is held for speculative purposes and is removed from the market so that the state is able to develop these areas where there is a failure to develop by private land. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, this is great because I think um, it can lead us to, to a follow-up conversation with Ilana from, from South Africa. Uh, because what I understand what happened in Kenya is that you do have a pilot intervention, lots of community social movement mobilization, right, uh, to try to, to change the status quo. And in order that uh, the government recognizes the reality, which is the informal occupation, right? And uh, from that, you have a special planning act from 2017, and these areas were declared were declared a special planning act, a special planning area. Sorry, where um, you can have flexible standards for building, construction, infrastructure, and also a fast track for land tenure. So I, I imagine we have similar cases here, here in Brazil to where I'm based right now. And I, I see, uh, I know that South Africa has a similar law. I don't know if other countries in, in, in Africa have, which is the Special Planning and Land Use Management Act uh, known as Pluma from 2013. It also has some mechanisms like the special development zones. Uh, they could be similarly implemented as the special planning areas in in, in, in Kenya as well. And I was just thinking, Ilana, um, you have managed to establish a very nice dialogue with the city of Cape Town, right? Um, I was just thinking if this could evolve to something more structured, like uh, the city having a fast track for, for, for these processes, right? Or a national policy that would, um, you know, enable experiences like the transaction center to, to take place at scale in many other communities, 
would that be helpful? How, how do you see this dialogue with the city of Cape Town evolving to some, towards something more institutionalized? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I mean, we are in the process of negotiating a much more formal uh, memorandum of understanding with the city uh, to enable us to expedite uh, the cases that we're working on. Um, um, and, and that sort of came out of, of probably 18 months of, of very frustrating experiences where we try to resolve cases, you know, speak to officials who are not terribly helpful because they don't know who we are and they don't know what we're doing. And, um, you know, so we, we saw that for us to scale up, we, we had to get a formal agreement uh, with clear lines of accountability, with good indications of turnaround times that we could then go back to clients and say, this is what you're likely to receive in terms of service levels from, from us. Um, and that process has been going very well. I mean, we've targeted two departments within the city. The one is the revenue department, because um, I mean, unlike some of the, the cases that we're discussing today, um, our office is focused on formal areas, actually. I think that's what makes our work quite unusual, is that we're actually um, we're actually not dealing with informal settlements. We are dealing with formal um, formal developments, formal properties that have been built at enormous cost to the state, but which have never been registered. And because there's no title, there's no administrative visibility, properties are not uh, in the billing system. And then when it comes to transfer, there are very high arrears on the property. So getting all of those administrative hurdles um, sort of removed requires us to, to negotiate with the revenue department and then obviously the human settlements department is actually building these these houses in the first place we, we have to have an agreement with them um, and that's been quite an interesting process um, there's a lot of willingness on the part of the city uh, to engage with us and we're now using the templates that we've developed with these more formal agreements uh, in the city of Cape Town with other municipalities. And, and it's, that's been an interesting process too, which we're just starting to engage on. So we know that for us to set up another office, we don't have another 18 months to bang our head against a wall to try and get an official to respond to an email on a case. Um, you know, you much rather start with those formal agreements. Uh, once you've got a template, once you've got a city where it's working, you can then go to the next city and the next city and the next city. And of course we learn as we go. So I think that's also critical out of the pilot is to really reflect back what worked well, what didn't work. You know, there were approaches we used at the city. We're definitely not gonna use those approaches when we move into other cities. So I think, I think it's, been, it's, been, it's been very helpful actually. Thank you very much, Ileana. I think the point that you raise, no, establishing a really targeted approach in a specific city, establishing a long-term dialogue, I think is quite relevant also what uh, Cities Alliance is also doing and trying to do uh, in Uganda uh, with our um, country office. So I would like uh, to invite my colleague Deborah Askit, which is um, the, um, the country program manager, to tell us a bit more about their experience in uh, exactly creating this long-term dialogue and um, with, um, with the urban poor informal community and the city officials, how this dialogue, this structural dialogue is, is taking place and also maybe to reflect uh, in connection to that um, to, on, on uh, the question that uh, is in the chat uh, about land grabbing. Um, so, uh, how we solve the conflict uh, between uh, um, external uh, giant companies uh, um, coming in uh, with, uh, with, the, with the protection of local population, the rights uh, of local population and secular land tenure. Uh, please, Deborah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenya. Um, hello, everybody. So just to pick up from where you have stopped, actually, um, I'll use the example of the social safeguarding project that we have as it is Alliance in, Kamp in Kampala actually. It supports the Kampala Jinja Expressway. And it is one of, it's the most densely populated area actually in, in Uganda. And it's an informal settlement, it's a slum. So the population really, uh, one of the key issues is lack of tenure, security of tenure. And so in, in, uh, in, in Addressing the safeguards, one of the things we do is to undertake a slum upgrading process. Now, this sounds and will sound very interesting to, to the private sector because it's a very densely populated area. 
and they could easily access this land. What we've done to handle and manage that situation actually is to undertake a lot of uh, partnership building with the community itself and setting up what is very similar to what has been done in South Africa, the Transaction Support Center. And so after a whole year of engagement with the community through what we call the settlement forums, where each community, LC1 village, comes together and discusses development issues, what we've ended up with is agreed on uh, setting up a, a, set, uh, a housing support center, which they prefer to call actually a community support center, because they see, see themselves as a, as a community. And this housing support center is the one that will drive the development, the slum upgrading, be it by undertaking small infrastructure projects, uh, infrastructure projects like building roads, waste management, uh, constructing toilets, uh, that all will be undertaken by the housing support center. And when we negotiate for tenure rights with the governments, uh, which owns part of the land, it will be through the housing support center. So they have a bigger bargaining power and it's difficult for um, a, pri a purely private company to make individual agreements with the, with, the, with the residents there because they are all op operating on getting these tenure rights through their housing support center. And so the main thing has been for us to make sure that there is meaningful participation, not just asking them, you know, what would you like, but really taking on board their comments, their suggestions, their decisions, their preferences, and also supporting them with the capacity building element because they might build infrastructure projects at their level, but looking at the longer term, what is the more relevant kind of uh, design that they could use that does not reinforce the, 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 the relatively poor conditions, but instead, uh, you know, sort of enhances them uh, or makes them a bit more uh, acceptable, so to say. So we've done a lot of capacity building, a lot of partnerships. We also have a, um, a mechanism for feedback from the community. To the, to the Cities Alliance, to the government, and we've also set up a joint governance structure, which is led by the Ministry of Lands, actually, and then you have the community represented, you have all the other actors like Cities Alliance, Slum Dwellers International, all of them participating um, in that governance structure. So the ownership has really been driven to the Housing Support Center, that they would feel the loss if any individual tried to sell that kind of interest. There's a high level of accountability within the community through this housing support center. So yes, that's what I'd, I'd like to submit. Thank you, Deborah, very much. Um, this also makes me think about the project implemented in the RC by IHDAC, and they had a very interesting approach to this multi-stakeholder engagement um, involving community members, customary chiefs, public officials, uh, civil society organizations, and also always having a focus on including women and also training young people. So I would like to invite Barthélemy if you could tell us a little bit more about how was this process, what were some of the challenges that you faced, and why you see this was extremely relevant. I'm sorry, I lost you for a minute. Uh, merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup pour les, les projets uh, en République démocratique du Congo. Uh, nous avons, d'abord, j'aimerais brosser le, le, le contexte. Le contexte, c'est qu'en RDC, uh, nous avons une dualité, uh, nous avons une dualité des lois. Nous avons Les, 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 les droits coutumiers avec les chefs coutumiers qui gèrent les terres, qui ont un pouvoir considérable sur les terres. Et de l'autre côté, vous avez l'administration avec euh, la loi positive. Et c'est fait en sorte qu'il y a les deux tendances se confronter. Il y a la loi, mais la loi n'était pas appliquée sur le terrain, mais au contraire, c'est des pratiques avec des chefs coutumiers. Alors, euh, Dans ces projets, nous nous sommes dit qu'il faudrait créer un cadre de participation où on met ensemble tout le monde. 
un espace de dialogue où, en amont, les chefs coutumiers, et là, c'est lui qui a le, le vrai pouvoir de terre euh, au niveau du terrain, les communautés qui habitent ces terres, on les met ensemble avec l'administration qui est le garant de la loi positive, et ensemble, les gens ont discuté pour éclairer la tenue foncière, pour euh, clarifier, élever certains conflits. Et nous avons appris de cette expérience euh, que nous avons faite à Kassangoulou, que c'était la toute première fois, il y a des chefs coutumiers qui nous ont dit, c'est la première fois qu'ils voyaient le conservateur de titres immobiliers. Les conservateurs, c'est le chef de l'administration foncière local. C'est la première fois qu'ils le voyaient, alors que le chef coutumier faisait leurs transactions. Inversement, vous avez les communautés qui sont à Kassangoulou, et selon un sondage qu'on a fait, on a sondé sur 116 propriétés, il n'y a que deux propriétés qui avaient un titre officiel. Alors, on a posé la question, mais les gens nous disent, mais pourquoi ils iraient vers l'État pour chercher des titres, c'est cher, c'est compliqué, et ainsi de suite. Alors, c'est dans les cadres participatifs, dans les dialogues multi-acteurs qu'on a fait, on a fait le pont entre les chefs coutumiers qui sont qui ont vu pour la première fois l'administration et l'administration qui avait des paquets de documents qui attendaient que les communautés viennent pour légaliser les titres et ils ne venaient pas. Donc, ce dialogue a fait le pont et directement le chef de l'administration, il a promis directement de dire que euh, tous les gens à partir du projet, ceux qui vont arranger leurs dossiers, ils seront d'office légalisés. Voilà un peu euh, ce que ce dialogue a amené pour l'exemple de, de, de la RDC. Il y a les communautés euh, qui, qui, qui s'en fichaient totalement, qui ne prenaient pas une priorité pour aller euh, sécuriser leurs titres. D'abord, il y a beaucoup qui ignoraient. Les projets ont amené la sensibilisation pour dire que, à, écoutez, à côté de, vous êtes à côté de la grande mégalopole Kinshasa. 15 millions d'habitants et la plupart des grands euh, riches de l'élite qui est à Kinshasa se déversent sur Kassangoulou pour chasser les terres. Il y a un problème d'insécurité de terres à partir de Kassangoulou et le projet a travaillé pour d'un côté sensibiliser les communautés sur euh, l'insécurité, sur les risques qu'ils couraient et de l'autre côté le projet a approché la démonstration vers les communautés et les résultats, c'est qu'à la fin du projet, pour la première fois, il y a un paquet de 98 demandes de communautés qui sont allées vers l'administration pour dire, écoutez, voilà, à partir du projet, nous avons nos titres qui ont été documentés par les drones. Nous avons, euh, parce que nous avons mis en place aussi une application donc, qui a sélectionné les données, la base de données les sortir sur une fiche. Voilà, nous avons des documents. Aidez-nous à sécuriser nos titres. Voilà euh, cette expérience que nous avons menée de la participation, mais également de l'engagement des communautés qui se sont rapprochées de l'administration pour protéger leur terre et éviter les risques d'accaparement des terres qui viennent de la grande mégalopole. Une fois de plus, je salue en passant le, le, le grand chef coutumier de Kassangoulou qui nous suit. Merci beaucoup, Barth Barthelmy. Uh, thank you um, for, um, for, for your intervention and for clarifying, I think, this project uh, in DRC. But I think all uh, the projects presented um, really highlighted also the connection between uh, um, women empowerment, gender equality and uh, security of land tenure. This connection is important because, uh, of course, women's economic empowerment, women's participation in political life of the city depends also on the access and control of their land for economic uh, or housing purpose. Um, and we have seen, uh, you mentioned, and also in the chat, someone even mentioned that women's, uh, but also community access to land 
uh, but even more for women, is also um, restricted by the lack of implementation of existing laws, but, but also by customary norms, uh, power structure within the community and households, cultural also traditions. So uh, my question, um, also I would like to invite uh, Evelyn Benjamin Samson from Street, uh, Streetnet International. She's the organizer of West and Central Africa, so she has really a regional experience uh, to reflect on this aspect. And based on her experience, uh, Evelyn, what are the specific challenges that women face when we come to access to land and control over land? And what kind of specific targeted also action we can put in place to break traditional power structure, to change also the cultural norms. This requires, of course, a long-term engagement, long-term change. But what is your experience? What are the actions that you have undertaken um, in, the, in, in your experience? Thank you very much. Evelyn? Yeah, thank you, Yelena. Um, first of all, I want to thank the City Alliance for such an opportunity. And also to tell you, it's a learning session for me in particular. I'm not you here. Thank you very much. I think the challenges are enormous for our women and young persons. We see that in uh, working with the Street Net International, you see three sided challenges or a triangular everything. One side is challenge for uh, of having a space, public space. They don't have places where they even work. Economically, they are at, uh, they, they are confronted. They have a confrontation or a challenge confronting them. Then the other side is um, residents. You, you, you can see that they have many of our members or informal workers or street vendors or market vendors. Most of them, they don't even have good places to where they call their homes. And the other side is for sustainability reasons. They, some of them may like to cultivate because of the issues that popped up during the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Some of our members are there. So will, these are the three areas I would like to. But uh, when we talk about public space, you see, most of these people, like some of us already mentioned, there's a lot of privatization going on. Public spaces are being sold to private ent enterprises entities. And because of that, they, they, they sent these people away. It was very sad when uh, the lockdown, during the lockdown in Senegal, for instance, uh, when people were home and they were supposed to resume, people were happy. But some people, some these street vendors, they came and they realized that their place had been taken over. So uh, uh, based on this, we are, we are advocating, we are insisting on getting themselves, these people are not registered, they are not even formal. So they are not, uh, no, uh, they don't have their names in any uh, registered or formalized this thing, uh, registers. So it was very difficult. They had to stay home while people were working. But it was a, a double agony for them. They lost their capital and it became a very terrible situation where street net uh, spoke with it as uh, representatives there. They, they worked at networking with other partners, pushed for their voice to be heard. They went to them, they were able to push through for the government to recognize them, to uh, begin to align with what uh, principles, better principles for their uh, involvement. So these are, this is just one example of what example. They are having problems with privacy because they, they don't have titles to it. They are not even recognized or even given any uh, recognition. I, you can see that based on this, apart from this, uh, after the COVID crisis, uh, before I go to the other side, people had issues when it rained. The, their residents, most of them, they are vulnerable. They don't have the resources to rent uh, at a very good place. So they are in the slums. And when it rained, I tell you, it was sad when one of my, our, our affiliates took pictures of the, the, the houses that had pulled down because of uh, 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 flooding. And it was very sad. They, they were already in crisis. 
the COVID crisis and, 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 and outcomes, and then they, they, they didn't have a place to stay also. So most of our people are vulnerable and they don't even have good place. So that the, the other time there was a, a webinar and I attended and I heard you talking about some of these things. I said, wow, so there is a hope somewhere there can be partnership somewhere for some of these people to be reached. And today when I listen to you, I will see that. And it's, this is a very good work, City Alliance, you are into. Uh, 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 apart from this, uh, uh, there is this desire to work to, for sustainability because the crisis of COVID has exposed the, uh, to a larger extent the, state, the extent of their, their vulnerability because there is no social protection for them, there is nothing. And the interventions government put in place make when talking to many of them, we have interacted with our athletes across Africa and even across other regions of the world. You notice that most of the interventions didn't even reach the most vulnerable because there are no institutions, there are no, there are no integration in approaches. They, they just give it to anybody and they, don't even, they are not able to reach the real people who need the, the, the interventions. So Free Street Net International is insisting on engaging in uh, 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 enterprises that could give a level of guarantee in case uh, government institutions are not able to come to our aid. We shouldn't be so vulnerable and at, at, the, at the mercy of a, a, a bigger institution elsewhere. So we are pushing for uh, a, a sustainability in intervention and because of that, after raising a lot of awareness and speaking about up, most of our affiliates are now yearning. Some of them are going for land. They are negotiating with um, uh, mayors and their chiefs for land. An example is that of uh, Burkina Faso, where Sinafe, our affiliate there, have been able to mobilize. Because people who are staying home, they have lost their capital. They deal uh, usually in fruits and vegetables. So they, they look for land and they started to cultivate uh, fruits and vegetables. But I think like one of, uh, I, I'm not putting the name well, said that there should be scaling up somewhere. There should be a progress. And they, having achieved this land, having, having gotten this land, that is Julia who was saying at Massey, having gotten this land, is it uh, at the end of it? Is tomorrow, aren't they going to be signed away? Because it's just temporary. So that there should be mechanisms that should lead to a, ten, a, a land ten, a tenure where they, there will be a level of security for them to cultivate because it has been helpful. Most of them got their full security from that place. And some of them, they were able to sell to help people who have been uh, sent out of their, because of lack of rent and poverty, they were able to help some to rent houses for some, some, some of our affiliates and members. So these are the issues and I, I can see that there is a lot of uh, capacity burden. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are into technological uh, awareness creation because they need to be aware of the use of technology. And we have uh, been able to uh, sort it for funding to equip them with communication, uh, communication gadgets so that we can talk and speak about our issues. And there are so many things. I'm now seeing that you are using technology to even uh, push for land security. So I think there are so many things we are learning from there. And uh, already we are engaged in getting these people to push for uh, recognition and also uh, speak with authorities, partner with uh, leadership and other like-minded uh, organizations so that they could get land to cultivate. But what after this, after getting the land, what is the next thing to do? So thank you very much for such an opportunity. <laughs> I think I will have to learn more from you. Thank you, Evelyn. I think you touched a uh, um, very important uh, topic and I would like also to continue with uh, your colleague from uh, State Net Interna uh, Street Net International, Loren, Loren Sim um, Sibanda. Welcome. Uh, I think uh, you mentioned no, the, also the impact of COVID on, um, on, also on informal workers. 
and I would like to, um, to ask Loren to, um, to tell us a bit more about uh, what is the impact of, for example, lo lockdown policies on the condition of women, uh, um, informal workers, and in general, informal, uh, the informal community, um, and what kind of action also StreetNet uh, uh, did over the past year to support, uh, um, to support uh, the, the, the street, uh, street vendors in that uh, very difficult and specific moment. Thank you very much. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, as StreetNet, uh, what we saw during COVID-19 was that uh, informal economy workers were adversely affected. And informal economy workers comprised a huge percentage of women and young people. And because the restrictions uh, did conform people to their homes and there was no opportunity to work, it became a very torrid time for not only the informal workers, but for also for their families and the beneficiaries whom they support. So what we saw was that um, many families actually had problems even putting food on the table, and uh, not even to speak about access to health facilities, which was very key during the COVID area, era. Uh, right now, what we are seeing is that there should be access to such things as um, sanitizers, face masks, consistent washing of hands, and uh, also affordable health care. So I think the COVID uh, period has highlighted the inequalities between those who are at an advantage, the informal economy workers and other vulnerable groups to show that there are groups in society who cannot easily access basic necessities in life. So what StreetNet has done we have been working with our affiliates and other organizations. We have been working with our affiliates and other organizations to put up uh, measures to assist our affiliates. For instance, working with WIGO, we shared information on how people could make their own sanitizer at home to enable them to keep safe as well as to keep their clientele safe. So that was part of the capacitation which our members received. And also as affiliates, many affiliates went out to do their own masks. They made their own masks. They also helped their members to be able to design face masks. But still looking at that, that is not enough. Even though we were innovative, our members were innovative, affiliates were innovative, we still need to continue to engage the different governments to scale up on access to universal social protection to ensure that everybody is protected, especially the vulnerable groups, the informal economy workers should also be, have the social protection that they need because informality is defined by the limited or lack of social protection in the area of their work. So we really need to keep talking to our governments based on the international labor standards as well as the international standards to which our governments are party. I will give an example of the International Labor Organization uh, conventions and recommendations, which also touch on the informal economy. When we look at the International Labor Organization Recommendation 204, 
it speaks to the transitioning of the informal economy to formality. And that speaks to the ways in which governments can work together with the informal economy workers to bring the dignity to the work of the informal economy workers. First of all, speaking to the recognition and respect of informal economy workers as workers themselves. Because looking at the global picture, there is a rise in informality and also the change in places of work and change in the form of work that the different people around the world do. So that calls for a need to avail social protection flaws to everyone. And social protection flaws also it covers the health, universal health. And when we speak about health, especially during this time where we are facing COVID-19, we are also looking at the issues of uh, access to, let's say, the COVID vaccine. Uh, we have seen that there has been a rollout globally for people to get vaccinated. And even as people are vaccinated, they sh we should continue to engage communities, even engage the informal communities, those in the informal settlements, those in informal work, uh, to educate them on what the vaccines are all about, the effects of the vaccines and how they stand to be protected. So people have got to be in the know even as they can, so that they can be enabled to take steps to demand that they be vaccinated and also to engage their different governments so that they also have uh, access to all these uh, health uh, facilities and also the health benefits that everyone else is benefiting. What we also saw Due to lack of opportunity to work, there was a high loss of livelihoods. And right now, as people are trying to get back to work, there is no capital for some of the informal economy workers to resume their work. StreetNet has been working with other partners also to help the affiliates on various methods on how they can recapitalize and revive the work of their members. And one good example that I will give would be to say, COVID-19 has taught us that we cannot continue to operate the same way as we have been doing. There has to be a shift in how people have been operating. For me, this uh, topic about land tenure is very interesting because when we look at access to land for women, for informal economy workers, as well as the youth, there is a deficiency there. And what can be done is to avail land to these marginalized groups so that they can also work to the fullness of their potential, assist them to be able to get land for themselves. Because once they've got the power of controlling their own land and have a tenure of their own land, they can then shift from working in the streets, which expose them to harassment and violence, and work in their own space where they can have quality of work and they can also produce quality products and they will be able to enjoy their own space because out there in the public spaces, very few governments allow informal economy workers or street vendors to work freely. They are often harassed and violated. And this also takes us to the another convention of the ILO, a recent one, 2019 Convention 190, 
which speaks to the elimination of harassment and violence in the world of work. I believe that giving access to land for women, informal economy workers, and the youth will get rid of some of these um, violence and harassment dynamics which they face. And um, as we talk about women, we cannot ignore that women go hand in hand with children. Informal economy workers have often uh, had very stringent measures in terms of how they raise their children, stringent measures imposed on them by their position of being informal economy workers, some work from hand to mouth, they cannot afford quality child care. But once we have a system which allows informal economy workers to own land or which gives access to land for informal economy workers, they will be able to set up their own child care facilities which will cater for their children and also give respect to the children's rights. I've often said being a child of the informal economy worker does not mean that child is a lesser child. They should also enjoy their right to be a child and enjoy their right to play and enjoy their right to growth because children need that kind of space. They don't need to be confined to a small corner where the mother is working or tied to the mother's back for the whole day. So even as we speak about informality, informality has got a human face. We don't only speak about statistics. Streetnet has also engaged and had uh, trainings for their affiliates. The negotiations and collective bargaining trainings. This training has actually capacitated StreetNet affiliates and uh, informal economy workers within those affiliates to be able to negotiate and collectively bargain for their right to the cities and also right to workspaces with local governments. So this has also resulted in some of our affiliates establishing memorandum of understanding documents or agreements with the local authorities. For now, I will stop here. Thank then you. I will continue when requested to speak again. Thank, Thank you. you, Lauren. I think you gave a great uh, overview of the issues, but also of the possible solution. And also you call for the, you really underline the urgency to address this topic right now and COVID-19 even uh, highlighted this even more. So talking about informality, talking about women, women in informal economy, women living in a context of informality, this is true everywhere in the world. So both in Europe, uh, in the Western world, uh, in Africa, in Asia, everywhere. So it's really important that uh, international community address this type of issues and understand also the complexity, you know, you mentioned so many interlinked aspects, the childcare issues, the work, the safety, the public space aspect. So we really need to address them all. And I think also planning, so the city level, that is this level that really integrate different sector can give also an answer. And we need to be very pragmatic and practical. We cannot just wait for uh, statistics and national, uh, national data, but really looking at what is happening uh, in, in reality. And I think the project that we have seen today try really respond and goes into this direction. So using digital technology, using involving community to get more information, to understand better the reality. And, uh, and maybe, uh, I don't know, um, I think uh, um, the Pamoja Trust uh, can, uh, in Kenya, um, also during the COVID-19 crisis, tried to address some of these issues. So uh, I would like to 
um, to ask uh, Diana um, if um, if you want to come in and tell a bit more about your, your experience. Thank you. Um, I think uh, for what Pamoja Trust uh, did, especially during the, the COVID, uh, the, first, the first time we had the, the major lockdown, was that uh, we relied a lot on um, our networks uh, in terms of how do we um, assist our communities um, to find these services that they didn't have. So, um, of course, there was challenge of uh, water, access to water, there was challenge to access to these masks. But what we did is that we relied um, uh, on, on the existing um, social groups that we had to mobilize, um, to mobilize them to uh, engage and to request for um, some services from the Ministry of Health. Um, uh, we, we actually even got the women's movement um, to, because we do have a, a movement of, of that brings together women from different areas. Uh, we did mobilize them to actually uh, uh, come together and start producing these masks uh, at a lower price uh, in a way that the people that uh, they were targeting, which is their communities will benefit and in a way that they would also get some, some money. So what, uh, because also at that time, we really didn't understand, uh, you know, it was, it was something that was very uncertain, something we did not really understand um, how, how to deal with. But I must say that the, the, that organized aspect of communities really came through as a solution for us. Um, I remember we even got uh, the Ministry of Health involved um, and they actually uh, distributed some of these uh, sanitation facilities within the markets in the informal settlements and in the markets uh, and in the informal settlements themselves. Um, I remember we also had uh, our STDM teams, which are the youthful teams, also being trained on how to uh, make the soap, the liquid soap, uh, at a cheaper price that they would then sell to the community, some of the community members themselves, or even outside the community. So um, despite the challenges that COVID uh, brought upon us um, at that time, I think we really relied on these organized groups to, to come together and to think of solutions. Of course, the most unfortunate thing was what most some of our communities experienced, the evictions, um, because at that time they were really very vulnerable. So that was one of the uh, very bad uh, picture that came out from that um, from that situation. But I think also that also did give us motivation to also think about how do we then try to avert uh, that kind of uh, um, of thing in case it happens again, where we now did uh, another kind of mapping for for those informal settlements that were facing similar evictions. But I think um, looking at it on a positive outlook is that um, um, this groups that we had, these uh, conversations that we were having already really worked for us. And maybe that is something we might want to um, really use in terms of even moving forward, is that how do we then mobilize communities in such uncertain times um, that we don't know how to, what, what is coming next, but how do we then uh, use the groups that we have to mobilize for solutions? Because uh, surprisingly, even some of these solutions were coming from the community themselves. I remember even um, because we do have resource centers in the communities, uh, in, in these settlements, um, some of those community centers were transformed into some sort of uh, mobile clinics or areas where people can get education on, on how to deal with the COVID situation. So a lot of our interventions were informed by community resources that they, they, they did have. And, and I think even moving forward, even now, uh, I think we are a bit better prepared. Our communities are a bit better prepared because also that time we were able to challenge the ministry to provide some of these services in this in this uh, informal settlement. Yeah, I think that would be my take on, on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, some of you have spoken as well about how important technology has been, especially now during COVID. Um, not just in terms of facilitating, facilitating communication and also continue with community mobilization during the, the lockdown and the pandemic, uh, but also how uh, technology can help guaranteeing and advocating for the rights um, of those who are most vulnerable, especially during this pandemic. So in light of this, I would like to call Tony from Cadasta to also make a point about this specific subject. And Tony has already worked with, with many of you. 
Tony, over yeah, to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Um, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to all the participants. My name is Tony Piascovi, and I'm the Global Program Director at Cadasta Foundation based here in Washington, DC. And um, I think I'll just keep my remarks very brief, but um, I wanna start by recognizing um, three of the grantees that Cities Alliance um, has as part of this program are also partners of Cadasta. And um, while Cadasta offers uh, software and equipment um, uh, technologies, um, I think it's interesting that all the technology has been mentioned across all of the, the grantees and in many of the discussions, but it is not at the, at the center. Um, and I think it's very interesting or, or, or we need to keep in mind that technology is a tool. It's not the solution in and of itself. And that um, even with the implementation of new technologies, be it software or equipment, um, you still need the other things and, and, and projects and the design of projects still need to consider all of the other things that have been mentioned, the legal frameworks and, and navigating those and the relationships um, that are required to navigate those, um, the participation um, uh, of different groups, and then also the theme of, um, of populations such as uh, women and youth. So I think technology is kind of a thread that, that, that goes through all of those, but you still have um, the essential project elements that need to, need to be addressed. And technology can speed up some of the, some of the steps um, by the use of um, mobile and tablet data collection, which several of the grantees mentioned using um, you know, handheld GPS devices, um, and then web-based um, GIS tools, and then using those GIS outputs um, for advocacy purposes, um, like I believe Pomoja trusted with their um, evictions uh, mapping and risk assessment around COVID-19. Some of the interesting things that we are seeing in the application of technology to secure tenure um, at Cadasta really involve um, the use of drones and drone imagery, um, which several of the grantees mentioned. I think one thing that's exciting for me to see is um, the, the way in which drone images can then be um, uh, turned into 3D community models. Um, and this is something that we are starting to explore with partners is the use of drone imagery to create 3D models of communities that then allow in community meetings and participatory processes. It's a, it's a, it's a very dynamic and interesting tool to use when you're talking about um, urban planning initiatives, infrastructure planning, um, et cetera. And so that's one of the very interesting things that we are seeing with more and more um, specifically urban projects that are seeking to secure tenure, um, not just in Africa, but, um, but in other parts of the world as well. And I think I will, I will turn it back over to our, um, our moderators to, to get to more questions. Thanks, Tony. Um, taking from, from, from your, your your say, um, this also reminds me of the project implemented in Zanzibar, um, for which you were also a partner. So I would also like to invite Primo to talk a little bit more about this project because um, you have partnered with the government and this was a central point. You collaborated with the government to create new, new data uh, collection protocols. And this also raises the whole question about um, data privacy and ownership today and who data belongs to, plus the security of how this data is treated as well. So Primos, um, I would like to, to invite you. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, I guess there's a couple of things here, right? One, um, so Spatial Collective has been, has been around for more than nine years now, and we've done uh, a lot of projects on tenure security in Kenya and um, Tanzania and other places. And, uh, you know, sometimes 
you know, as they will say, uh, the time needs to be right, you know, because uh, oftentimes our ideas were great. We knew, uh, you know, life will change. We, we, we were able to um, change the way that land is managed, you know, and all these things. But uh, um, maybe the, the partners, you know, maybe the government was not ready to implement those changes. But it seems like on Zanzibar, uh, they are ready. Uh, because they realize that uh, doing it the old way, uh, they're not going anywhere. And um, uh, also for us, the proof that they kind of adopted this technolog new technological approach was when we had to go back to Nairobi, uh, because we're based in Nairobi, um, uh, we, um, they said, okay, we understand you have to leave because of COVID, but we want to continue work. Uh, so we've been supporting them ever since remotely, basically, and uh, uh, this kind of shows us that they've adopted this approach of data collection. Um, they did have some uh, concerns, obviously, with using these new tools, and one of them was the biggest one, basically, was privacy. So um, Kadasta Foundation helped us set up um, uh, a very beautiful platform for collecting data in the field, you know, merge with drone imagery, uh, tablet based and they were okay with that they were even okay with you know not acquiring two centimeter accuracy because they understood that's kind of like uh, you know unreasonable uh, but with drone imagery we, we were able to acquire quite you know precise accuracy of uh, boundary points so they were okay with everything but uh, the, the only place where uh, there was a problem was um, uh, the, the cloud computing, right? They didn't want the data to travel through the internet or to be stored online somewhere. They wanted everything to be handled um, manually. So our data collectors, the students had to bring all the tablets every every day to the Commission for Lands where they were manually downloaded into the server there. So that's definitely one thing that I think um, all the governments are, might have issue with. It's the data privacy and how the data is handled. And it's, you know, they're coming from a good, like actually from a very positive place because they are concerned about their people, right? They're, they don't want the data for their people to be out there exposed, you know, somewhere online. Um, and in terms of to, to ensure kind of who the data belongs to, you know, we didn't actually change the way that uh, the process happens. Like, you know, we still do very um old school methods like you know radio announcements community meetings uh we even had you know the microphone on a car going around the community you know the community is aware of what is going on they participate in the process they assign the adjudication committee which follows the data collectors everywhere and all the data is returned to the community for verification right so only when the community verifies the data then the commission for lands issues the certificate of occupancy so that's kind of how we were able to keep it transparent you know so and also to include all the partners right um i have no idea if i answered any of your questions right now <laughs> uh, but uh, but i think this you know combination with like the technology and very being very careful with the data handling and then the community participation can can go a long way, right? Uh, yes. Thank yeah. You. Thank you very much, Primoz. Um, actually, this is also um, reminding us of um, the project implemented in South Africa, the, the Transaction Support Center, and how technology, you know, can support administrative visibility because they also worked um, with a blockchain system. Uh, which is very innovative. And then I would also like to call Ilana, if you could tell us a little bit more about that and how it has, um, how you have been working with the city of Cape Town to use this, uh, this blockchain mechanism. Yes, thanks for that. Um, uh, we, we ran a pilot um, in our neighborhood uh, where, the, where the office is, is located. So there are approximately a thousand properties that were built by government, uh, very beautiful properties actually. Uh, that have never been transferred to beneficiaries and they were built uh, in 2011 to 2014 so many many years ago and uh, the current occupants and the original beneficiaries often don't match uh, so we went through the standard process that many people have described of enumerating and gathering the data i think what often happens is that the data then is is on a spreadsheet somewhere 
and uh, it's never maintained, it's never kept up to date. Um, and uh, quite difficult uh, for all the parties involved in the property registration process to access the data because it's on a, a spreadsheet. So what's helpful about blockchain technology is it's distributed ledger, so we can have multiple parties with different permissions um, engaging with the data um, in a sequential way as the property pro uh, transfer process unfolds, and that's what we've been piloting. Um, uh, We've also been piloting um, the same sort of technology in an informal settlement that is in the process of being upgraded. And that's also quite interesting because the upgrading process, you know, life continues while there's upgrading in process. And of course, there's no way to keep that data up to date. And what you, what you really want to do is get community participation. Um, and, and again, I'm sure I'm, I'm everyone in the, in the, in this, in the Zoom room is, is, is fully aware of this, you know, to make sure that the officials have access to the same information that the community on the ground has access to. So if someone passes away or someone sells their property, that that information is validated and shared with the, with, uh, with the, the necessary participants in, in the system. Um, we also use in blockchain technology developing uh, to develop our case management uh, platform. So, so we, we're not intending to compete with the National Deeds Registry. It's a very sophisticated, albeit clunky system. We don't, we don't want to enter into a head-on competition with an existing formal system. But in the process of getting into the, the deeds registry, you've got to prepare a whole lot of documents, you've got to prepare the cases, make sure you've got all the underlying certificates uh, and signed documents. Um, and and uh, again, a blockchain-based mechanism can be helpful. It doesn't have to be blockchain, but you want something secure, you want something distributed, uh, you want to enable uh, full visibility um, with permission as to who can and engage with a property on certain on certain transactions as you prepare the matter uh, for uh, for registration in the deeds registry, um, and it, again you know back to the uh, earlier comment about working with the city, it allows us to give the city um, the authority to do certain things. It allows us to give perhaps lenders authority to, to do certain things that allows us to decompartmentalize rights in in very interesting ways. So. They're wonderful things that you can do with this. I think the major issue always is how do you get people to play along? How do we, you know, again, this is a social, this is a social uh, endeavor. Um, um, you have to get people um, recording the transactions. Um, we have to work with community leaders to make sure that that they're on board. Um, we have to work with city officials to make sure they use the system. So I think those are the challenges. Technology can allow things, but it's, it's definitely no guarantee, but I think lots of interesting and exciting opportunities to leverage that technology. Thank you, Ilana. A uh, lot of learning from, from all the experiences and uh, very honest um, uh, information sharing here in this panel. I'm really enjoying that. Um, so we, we have Matabu Makuta missing. She's director for Habitat for Humanity Zambia, but she also has an extensive career working around land tenure issues in, in many African countries. So Matabu, maybe you can share a bit uh, from your experience, some insights on, on these major questions that we are posting here, right? How can we scale up these pilot interventions? How we can change the ecosystems? How can we accelerate the process, you know, uh, based on technology, on participation? What are the big challenges and opportunities, uh, Matabo? Um, thank you very much. As mentioned, I work for Habitat for Humanity and I'm based in Zambia as the national director. And I would like to share with the members that have attended this forum and also appreciate um, the Cities Alliance opportunity to give us the space to share what we do as a global ministry as well as local entities in our countries. Um, I would want to um, share by saying we as Habitat for Humanity, we operate in nearly 70 countries. And we work towards the a world where everyone has a decent place to live. And we do that by building strength, uh, stability, uh, self-reliance um, in partnerships with families in need of decent and affordable housing. I must underline that key issues for today, the secure tenure, is a key challenge here in Africa. 
and mostly not only in Zambia, but in many countries, as has already uh, been mentioned by many of my colleagues in here. So the, the challenge of COVID-19 has actually um, uh, highlighted that around the world, housing is key. And as we face both public health and economic crisis, that was, it worsens the housing crisis. And we know that most of our people, mostly where we are experiencing high urbanization rate, we um, encounter problems of deteriorating basic services, as well as lack of decent housing for majority of people that migrate to urban areas who at the end, they reside in informal settlements. And I must mention that we as Habitat for Humanity globally and regional and locally, we have a position where we want to urge government to prioritize housing. And indeed, as COVID has actually uh, demonstrated as the first line of defense against COVID-19 transmission, we also want to make sure that we do that in partnerships. Let me now highlight that. We work at both upstream at, and downstream. This is upstream where we work through the advocacy programs where we influence as well as to facilitate change in policies and systems. And I would want to talk to that in relation to access, participation, affordability, as well as inclusiveness. I will talk more of the vulnerable communities and vulnerable groups that we as Habitat for Humanity endeavor to change their lives. Let me just um, uh, zero down to Zambia and give some practical experience of what has been discussed right now and what we are doing as Habitat for Humanity Zambia. And I must mention that indeed we must also recognize that there are some strides that the government and many actors in this sector have done a lot. And I must mention that within the legal framework, let me highlight that um, the constitution of the Republic of Zambia um, does not allow discrimination. And I must uh, talk to this issue on gender equality and mostly women who most of the time are marginalized. And much as it, it does recognize that there should be no discrimination, however, we still see a huge disparity in terms of access to land by women. And this has created challenges for women empowerment in order to have access to land, not only land, but secure land rights for them to progress, to improve their own um, households. Let me mention that um, the, the, the Urban and Regional Planning Act of 2015 gives us a chance to do something to work with the municipalities to change the status quo on the ground in order to recognize the continuum of land rights through what we call fit for purpose land administration. And here in Zambia, we are advocating more of recognition of occupancy licenses. We know that occupancy licenses give a tenor of 30 years. And this at least gives some form of guarantee of security for the properties, though it's not per se giving the security on the land itself. However, we do believe that it, during those transition period, as we work towards empowering communities to be able to have mechanisms of livelihoods, then they can transition to the land titles which um, here could be modernized land leases. And here in, in Zambia, we have been working with the government, government ministries, as well as actors 
in coalitions and partnerships to advocate for the recognition of, of these occupancy licenses. And indeed, we have made some strides where the occupancy licenses are not free and thus they are not affordable to majority of the informal settlers. We then therefore negotiated with the municipalities as Habitat Zambia and other actors that we work together with like Zambia Land Alliance and many others that are like-minded like us, that they could be given an opportunity to pay over time than to pay upfront because affordability is another challenge. And then um, we also negotiated um, uh, that we, through, through the programs that we do, the support of the grants that we get from the international donors, we are now strengthening the participation and building capacities of our communities to be able to have a voice and be able to, um, to, to be able to stand up for their rights. And we do this through um, community-based uh, methodologies and approaches. And I must want to highlight a few of those that we use. And this includes through the programs that we implement in one of the largest Makululi um, slum area in, in, in Zambia, in Kabwe district. We do what we call formation of study cycles groups. This is where we are empowering uh, the communities uh, with knowledge on land rights, awareness raising, and as well as how to be able to demand their rights, you know, to hold the duty bearers accountable. We also um, orientate these study cycles as how to be involved in decision making in the structures that could mainstream all this uh, community-based uh, um, information that could at least enhance the legal frameworks. And we also um, hold community dialogues and do entrepreneurship uh, savings. And most importantly, we form savings groups and we want them to be better citizens, to be able also to take responsibility of their own um, uh, uh, destiny. And through that, we are able to teach them liter through literacy um, trainings, how to do savings um, and also doing business plans, entrepreneurship, uh, income generating projects. And with that, the aim is ultimately to get the secure titles. And we negotiated with, for example, the Lusaka Municipality and Indola Municipality Council to actually allow these people to also pay over time for the security of tenants. As we talk to uh, issues of gender equality, and we know that for sure in these informal settlements, particularly in Zambia, 70% of our urban population reside in informal settlements. And those that are affected mostly are women. And mostly we will find that in the groups that are set up, majority of uh, our participants and beneficiaries are women and youth, and those that are the ones that are benefiting out of the housing uh, intervention solutions that we provide here in Zambia. And I think lastly, I may want to mention that all the key issues that have been raised throughout the discussions and the projects that have been uh, supported by Cities Alliance, there are very key uh, takeaways that I would want to talk to you, which I guess um, the technology is good because as we do empower these communities, indeed, most of the informal way of handling some of this uh, data and many other processes is indeed um, long overdue. However, we might also be mindful of the fact of it, digitalization also comes with cost. We must also be mindful of how best can we make it more pro poor for everyone to be able to access these digital platforms, to be able to access data. Um, I think I also want to talk to the issue of the STDM. And STDM, I would want to compare it as also a, a continuum of land rights, which we appreciate. 
And we want to support that processes to be integrated and mainstream in the legal frameworks that could apply to, to globally in the, in, the, in the country to uh, alleviate the issues of access to decent housing. And the issue of uh, that creation of STDM also brings up the, uh, the issue of creating voice and space for the voiceless. And we really like to um, work around that issue. And that's what we do as Habitat for Humanity globally and here in Zambia. And lastly, I have already talked about the issue of affordability. And now um, the, the innovation, you know, to move from this manual processing of all these good interventions and initi initiatives, we have to also be uh, moving to that digital space where we can minimize the human error and also making sure that we increase efficiency. The timeliness that I had one of the colleagues talk about taking 50 minutes to one hour, where it used to take for you know, years and years to do paperwork to and fro, which can never um, be um, um, equated to any um, issues of uh, efficiency. And the engagement of the youth in all this is very key. As we know that youth is the wealth and the generation of future, we have to capacitate our youth as well. I think up to this far, this is what I want to um, share as Habitat globally, but uh, more uh, with what we do in Habitat Zambia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matabo. Um, this was a very good summary, and I think you were able to address all the topics beautifully. Um, we are coming to the end of our roundtable now, but I would like to also call upon Danilo Antonio from the Global Land Tool Network Program to assist us with wrapping up this, this discussion. Danilo, over to you. Danilo, you are on mute. Yes. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to talk to myself. It, it doesn't answer. So thank you for reminding me. <laughs> uh, that this is really a, a welcome uh, discussion. It's really, uh, I would say, it's very interesting. It's uh, even on my personal level, uh, I'm, I'm really uh, uh, sort of uh, really uh, this is like a dive into this kind of technology and how technology could actually support land tenure security. Uh, and, and, and this is really a, a very good uh, kind of discussions and really thank you for the three, four case studies and uh, maybe people may think that they are learning from one another but I think from the global perspective from the global actors we are also learning from them in fact much much more uh, that actually give us more uh, in terms of knowledge. Uh, I'm not sure if I could provide I would say a, a justifiable kind of takeaways or conclusion on this because it's so much knowledge uh, there's so much information and of course there's a lot of good practices around but allow me to start that uh, uh, what we're trying to do here is basically supporting what already member states already have been uh, agreed in, in terms of the global commitments where i'm talking about the solo, uh, this the, of course the sdgs uh, the new urban agenda uh, then we, we even we have this uh, uh, I would call the the African or the regional uh, framework and guidelines on land policy in Africa, which put women empowerment and tenure security uh, you know at the center of development. We also have the voluntary guidelines on land tenure, uh, on the governance of tenure on land for fisheries and forests, which uh, I would say institutionalize the word legitim legitimate rights. So we're not even talking anymore about legal rights, but we're also talking about legitimate rights. And most of the, the grant or the projects we're talking about is really more of they already have that legitimate rights. It's really for the government and for the stakeholders to actually provide that kind of uh, last step, which is really to, to make it record their rights and make it public and actually protect those rights. So, and, and that, that's where uh, I think it's uh, what's happening is that technology can actually support this. 
Uh, a little bit of background. I'm, uh, you know, I'm Danilo Antonio. I'm from the Global Land Tool Network. Uh, our last speaker, our colleague from uh, Zambia, already sort of introduced what is Global Land Tool Network. Uh, it it uh, it's a network of partners dealing with tenure security uh, by promoting la continuum of land rights, uh, but also through, uh, if you like, development implementation of what we call fit for purpose. Uh, administration tools and policies. Uh, in one of the chat, I, I, I've seen uh, some chat uh, in terms of uh, rights uh, beyond titling. And that exactly summarizes what we normally say continuum plan rights, uh, especially in the urban sector, especially on the urban slums. While we may aim for the, the, best, uh, the best tenure, we may not have it. So rather than aim for that and wait for decades of action. We may wa want to aim for, you know, the, the, the uh, intermediary uh, tenure instruments that potentially the government can easily provide, not only because uh, of the, uh, the legal issues, but also potentially uh, that's the only thing that they can afford for now. Uh, so that's kind of a dialogue that needs to happen. Now, when we talk about technology, uh, and it's really good to hear that, uh, to alert us and remind us, technology is really just a tool. It, 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 it makes our, uh, our work easier, if more efficient and more effective. But it, it, it is not, it, it, it does in, uh, encompass a lot of things. And one of them is obviously participation, engagement, uh, ownership by the communities, and uh, making sure that, uh, you know, technology because it's, a two, it's always a two-edged sword, is actually a uh, use for uh, the betterment of uh, more people in the society. So, um, and what I, I'm hearing from, from, at least from the projects, is they, they, they make sure that the technology is, is actually responsive uh, to the challenges and to the issues at hand. So that's where uh, we, we would normally come uh, in terms of uh, fit for purpose. The one technology may not necessarily be applicable to another case. I mean, for example, uh, I mean, uh, I am fan also of drones, but uh, in, in other cases, drones may not necessarily be an effective tool. For one, it lessens the participation of community members. There, how many people can actually, uh, you know, uh, if you like, do mapping uh, using drones? You only need one or two people. But if, if, if you make it more, uh, if you like, uh, less in terms of technology, then more people you can actually invite and participate and actually engage. Uh, I've seen some uh, people in, in Zambia where we can actually uh, uh, engage a 60 year old woman. Uh, we can actually do the mapping. Uh, they cannot do the drones, but you know, uh, with some techniques, they can also do, uh, you know, sketch mapping, for example. And, what I, I just want to make uh, to emphasize here is what, what I'm seeing is uh, technology being the means. What we're actually trying to get is actually the information. And that is normally absent in, in an informal settlement or slums. It is always absent uh, and not recognized uh, you know, in the cadaster or a formal land administration system. So that information actually creates knowledge and it actually empowers communities and households. And, and that's where we, we I would say we should focus on because if we have that information, uh, not just it facilitates tenure security, but it actually gives us empowerment. And I think I've hear a lot of these words empowerment. If you don't have access to technology or information, empowerment is, uh, I would say, is, is simply, uh, you know, a rhetoric only. Uh, you need to have that kind of information uh, communities needs to have that kind of access to the system. Uh, otherwise, it will be difficult to say uh, and, and also to sustain uh, the interventions. So that's really something that we, we need to look at. Uh, and uh, I just want to em emphasize, I think I heard that uh, from, from our colleagues also, that uh, what we're trying to do, uh, you know, pilots, for example, interventions, uh, and we need to uh, link this up in terms of the institutional uh, strengthening, but also in terms of the legal policy issues. 
well, we, uh, and this is where the fit for purpose land administration comes in. Uh, it's not just about uh, looking at the fit for purpose, but looking at alternative ways to provide tenure security for people, uh, especially in uh, in urban uh, slums, but also in customary land areas. And uh, how does it work? Well, it, it, it works in three pillars. You look at the spatial, and this is uh, what our projects are actually trying to do. Uh, of course, it would be really good if the legal and the policy are already in place. Uh, for example, uh, the one in, uh, in Zanzibar, uh, and uh, uh, potentially also the one in Kenya. But what, what, what it does is it, it, it cuts across these three pillars, the spatial, the policy, and then the institutional aspect. So the policy aspect is, I would say, the most difficult one. It takes a lot of time. And I can also see the chat and it's justified that they cannot wait for any policy for 100% tenure security. What they need now, especially in COVID, you know, access is to water, sanitation, infrastructure. And, and that's it uh, for me and uh, you know, the way we're looking at it. Once the government also provides some kind of investment, you, you have some kind of indicators that you're moving towards more positive in, in terms of tenure security. Then the institutional aspect is also, if you like, the more, uh, a more difficult aspect because the institutional, particularly the government authorities, uh, are, are, are mostly uh, looking at technology to, to drive policy and practice. And it should be the other way around. For example, uh, if, if really, the government of Uganda wants to uh, to uh, to have uh, equal access to to, to land and, uh, and other resources. Then technology could actually facilitate that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it could actually uh, change the policy or it should drive the the practice. It should be the other way around. Well, what does it mean? Uh, if the intention is to provide tenure security for all, which the SDGs and new urban agenda are promoting then let's try to do it. Uh, and and, and we, we cannot, for example, adopt a very uh, thorough and very expensive uh, equipment or land surveying equipment or technology, uh, just to say that it, more accuracy means more tenure security. Well, it's not really true. So what we need to do is uh, more, more in terms of coverage uh, and then adopt enough accuracy, if you like, and then uh, go for it. And I think that's, uh, that's also some of the lessons of the projects we're looking at. Uh, a, a lot of questions around how do we scale up? I mean, uh, GLTN uh, was established in 2006. And this is the same questions we're asking. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we're looking at, again, is these three pillars of policy, institutional, and spatial. And we're kind of moving uh, and working a lot on technology and spatial, and of course on the policy side, but what's really missing is on the institutional aspects. And we, I think a lot of projects always uh, try to uh, put a little bit of emphasis around this because it's, it's a mind, mind change issue around the institution. You need to convince the bureaucracy to actually adapt, for example, these technologies. And in manual, uh, they won't. Most likely they won't. Uh, for, for, for reasons, for example, uh, in Uganda, uh, it's not even allowed to use uh, drones for security reasons or whatever reasons they have. Uh, so then the innovations cannot come there. Uh, or in, uh, in, in, in uh, the one in, in Zambia, uh, there, there's a very good kind of land tenure instrument of 10 years of open sea land citizens. Uh, UN Habitat uh, uh, develop and process about 20,000 uh, kind of applications. Then the government came back and say, well, you need to pay more uh, so that you can, you can get these licenses. So it's a policy issue, but it's also an institutional issue. Uh, can you imagine 20,000 households? Uh, you know, that's almost like 150,000 people that could be immediately impacted by this tenure security, but it's now being, uh, if you like, being uh, hampered uh, by uh, some kind of policy, but more, li li more likely in terms of the uh, institutional aspect. The mindset setting uh, is very difficult and no technology can actually uh, deal with it. Of course, we also need uh, political will. Uh, and a, a good example of that, uh, we, we have this uh, project in, uh, in Nepal 
where the uh, the inv invasions in the fields informed the policy. Uh, and uh, and then the, the government uh, adopted uh, in just two and a half years a national land policy that actually uh, supports the uh, uh, women's access to land, but also identified that they have, and they have accepted that they have at least 2.5 million people or household that have no tenure security, and therefore they need to provide tenure security in some ways. So that's something that uh, we could look at. So uh, again, another issue, uh, and uh, we, we heard something from our colleagues from the bank, is the finance. I mean, see this alliance, UN Habitat, uh, other international development partners, we, we are all, always looking for funds to support this kind of activities or in innovations. But obviously that, that's not enough. Uh, the, 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 the big funding uh, streams are all still coming uh, to the rural development and food security, uh, and that uh, and that is a fact. Uh, there are very few donors who actually uh, spend more uh, investments on urban. Uh, simply, well, one way to look at it is it's very complicated. Uh, but you know, uh, but also uh, again, the issue is around tenure security. You know, I mean, it's very difficult to provide infrastructure if the the, the settlement have no tenure security. Uh, so that even the private sector have difficulty providing the, uh, I would say, uh, the, the utilities. So the finance aspect is probably we need to look at, you know, and, and, and really invite other donors to come in and provide uh, this kind of uh, support to civil society organization, grassroots organization, to, to do what they're doing now, uh, given the, the weaknesses from the national or local authorities. So that's really a call, uh, you know, uh, maybe a challenge even, uh, even for us uh, to bring that, uh, that finance uh, into the hands of the community themselves uh, or women's associations, because they, they know more and they can do more. And it's not just, they're not, they're not just beneficiaries, but they are actors and actually they can actually provide solutions also. And, and that's something that we could uh, actually look at. And one of the things that uh, we will have a problem uh, is, you know, uh, sustainability, of course, also uh, needs to be linked with authorities. And this is where the problems of technology. Uh, so if at the beginning we actually are able to engage local authorities or government, then that is really very good because we can potentially scale up. Uh, our experience in, in Uganda, for example, the STDM that's normally used by urban, uh, urban, uh, urban slum organizations uh, with Slum Dwellers International or Act Together is now being adopted by the government uh, for the formal issuance of land, uh, custom, customary land uh, ownership titles. So what does it mean? So we're able to bring it with the national government uh, system simply because they are involved at the very beginning uh, and it takes time though. So scaling up, a question of scaling up also takes time. Uh, and I think uh, from our perspective, uh, yes, scaling up is, is great, uh, but we should continue looking at how to scale up horizontally from all these uh, innovations uh, at the grassroots level. And, and that's really needs to, to happen. Uh, partnership is also very key. I think I, I, I've, I heard a lot of these things uh, but we need to do more, I guess. I mean, uh, bring more uh, government officials or institutional institutions or private sectors on the table, on the dialogue. These kind of things that were happening now is a round table. Uh, it's good to bring them there, including the customary or traditional authorities. Uh, and uh, because, well, one thing that we, we, we need to look at is around capacity building. Uh, and again, uh, the, there's a lot of very good policies, even in, in, in Africa. The question is around how they actually implement land policies. And, and, and the questions around uh, stick, sticking to the traditional ways of, uh, or conventional ways of technology or land administration, which normally uh, borrowed from, uh, mostly from the first world countries during the colonization. Uh, but also there's a tendency from the government service and I can talk about it because I came from government service, is we, 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 we tend to jump, you know, uh, even if the, the issue is so big, we want to actually adapt what 
for example, what Sweden or Netherlands did. They never even thought that Netherlands, for example, or Australia took them hundreds of years to actually came to that kind of position. Uh, so that's something that we can look at. So where do we go from here? Uh, my suggestion is uh, continue to communicate, con continue to, to dialogue, uh, it bring bring the professionals, bring the institutions and government officials in the in the negotiation table. I think that's where potentially as uh, as facilitators of development, Cities Alliance, UN Habitat, uh, as you can see, Slum Dwellers International, uh, Street International. Uh, these are the things that potentially we could actually do. I could also see Habitat for Humanity is there, Tadasta Foundation. Uh, these are ways that potentially. Uh, because at the level of the grassroots community, they can only provide the solutions around the spatial. They will try to, to bring this to the attention of the government policymakers, but they will, have, they will have an issue unless you have a mass movement around it or uh, you know, you're doing it on large scale and they will find you because they can see it's work. But then the, uh, as potentially the bridge, I think we need to, uh, to, to look at this also. Uh, obviously, uh, a, a plea to our development partners or, you know, to actually provide more support and financing support to this kind of uh, uh, interventions. Uh, people really need it. Uh, I mean, from our GLTN program, I think 50 to 60 percent of our funds actually goes to, the, to this kind of level of work uh, and, and, and provide uh, tenure security. Uh, I will stop here, uh, and uh, I, I'm really hoping for, uh, I, think, I think, continuing the journey with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danilo. Um, Anna? Over to yeah. you now. Sorry. Yeah, I think I think we yeah we had a very nice thank you Danilo for for raising those points. Yeah, we do have with us our upcoming still in his position, Greg Munro. Um, and Greg, um, would you like to share some final insights with us before we close? Thank you, Anna Claudia. I really join just to learn more than than to give input, but. And I found this quite fascinating. I mean, um, the use of technology is, is, could be a, a, a key addition to, to the work on land tenure, but I'm very pleased that, that genders come through very strongly because we know that, that patriarchal systems are deeply embedded in land tenure. And I just think one of the things we really need to do is to engage with the legal and policy process and to engage our politicians because they do have the power to change this. And I want to use one example. India, India has been in a process of building a lot of homes as a step to, as a step to, to uh, lifting the next 200 million people out of poverty. And in one of the states, the state minister decided that all of these new homes would be registered in the name of the woman of the household, not the man. And with a stroke of a pen, there was a huge benefit to millions and millions of women. And I do think we need to continue advocating with our politicians to, to make the, the land tenure process simpler, easier, and fairer. But that's going to take time. And in the meantime, we need to work together, uh, working on land tenure, looking at issues around site tenure services infrastructure, which all your panelists have, have, have raised. And when we have countries like South Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, DRC, Ghana, all in this room. And we need to work together technically, um, especially in the lessons we've learned from COVID and to learn from the experiences and to advocate together on the issue of land tenure. And I really do look forward to working with all of you when I start in three weeks time. Thank you, Anna-Claudia. Thank you, Gabby. Wonderful, Greg. Thank you for this last minute spontaneous input. <laughs> Very welcome. Gabby. Yeah, um, just thank you, Danilo, for this comprehensive wrap-up and also Greg for this very important closing remarks and welcome to Cities Alliance. Um, thank you again for all the... I, I know we could go on and on and we have a very nice... Um, 
set of panelists here. But thank you all for, for the panelists and for the Citizen Alliance colleagues as well for embarking in this discussion with us. And I wish you all a nice continuation. Stay safe and check our website for more information on the Secure Tenure Initiative. Oh, also there is a, a quick survey at the end of the chat because of course we always want to hear uh, from you and, and keep improving. So please, if you have two minutes to just reply to survey, that would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye, it was really great. Bye. Thank you, goodbye. Bye everyone, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye to everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. Au revoir. Merci beaucoup. Ciao, Barthélemy. Ah, we forgot to take a picture. <laughs>